Allison Amaker. I'm the Director of Youth and Family Ministries here at St. Mark's, and I wanted to thank all of you for joining us uh, for our summer trip celebration today. Before we get too far in, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this trip, uh, which started for me in the spring of 2022. Uh, I had a conversation with Steve Balzell uh, right before uh, Michelle's schedule. Um, and we talked about the possibility of taking a group of youth to Navajo land. Um, and I said, that sounds great. And I said, there's a lot of planning that needs to go into that. Let's talk 2023. Um, and we agreed to go on an exploratory trip. We went out uh, in Veterans Day of 2022. We stayed for three days at St. Christopher's Mission. We met the senior warden. We met uh, mission staff members and several community members, uh, along with Kit Arrington and Steve Gauzel. In January, we met to decide whether or not we thought the youth trip was viable. Spoiler alert, we absolutely did. <laughs> we wanted the youth of St. Mark's to experience the beauty of God in a different way the beauty of the land in a different way, and the beauty of the people of the community we have interacted with. And thus, the Navajo Land Trip was born. But building a program from scratch is not a small task, particularly when most of your references and resources are in a remote area 1,700 miles away. We spent the next seven months meeting regularly, often weekly. We talked about accommodations and food. We talked about geographic locations that we wanted to visit. We talked about the community we experienced. We talked about what it might look like to prepare and educate our youth and ourselves about the Navajo land community, how to be respectful of entering into another cultural space. We talked to other Episcopal churches who had visited the summer before. Two youth ministers in the Diocese of Pennsylvania were particularly helpful. We wanted to plant seeds for relationship building, with the hope that this summer trip to St. Christopher's would not be the last summer trip to St. Christopher's. Even early, we knew that flexibility was going to be the name of the game. I remember saying at a meeting that we should plan as best we could and be aware that we didn't know what we didn't know. We told each other and the youth that we needed to be open to outcomes. This proved itself true even the first night after a 14-hour travel day. <clears throat> Arriving at St. Christopher's close to midnight Eastern Standard Time, we found that the rooms that Kit and I had planned to stay in had a ventilation system that was broken. We slept on the couches in the community center that first night. This also showed true as we came to understand that our hosts had a different sense of time and presence than we had assumed walking in. We came with hour-by-hour -hour plans, how long it would take to this venue or that, how long we assumed a project would take. And very quickly, these gave way to new plans. The tiny houses we had planned to paint were mostly finished. <laughs> that led way to helping to clean uh, the local cemetery, honoring Navajo custom around the dead. We planned a day to pack boxes of food and go into the reservation. This quickly became two days of unpacking boxes. Our contacts who went to get the food found that there was a second shipment coming with twice as much food as we had planned in about half the organization. <laughs> Being flexible wasn't always easy. We didn't always get it perfect. But I truly believe that God showed up on our trip because of that in ways that I never would have anticipated. Our group went to two museums in the area, one of which was the Navajo Nation Museum that we visited on our first day in Winnow Rock, Arizona. The museum
museum has information on historic and modern Navajo figures. We saw the pictures of the current president of the Navajo Nation next to an exhibit tracking various treaties signed by the United States and the Navajo, most of which had been broken by the United States. It also included an art gallery dedicated to local artists, representing community struggle with alcoholism. Immediately next to that, a photography exhibit of the Navajo Code Talkers. All of this brought insights and images to our experience before we even laid our head down on the first day. But for me, the part of our trip that I will cherish most was time with the people of St. Christopher's. We began each morning doing morning prayer with Nate, who works for the Fluff Post Office, and Margaret, the St. Christopher's Senior Warden. I got to hear each member of our group reading a prayer or a reading throughout the course of the week. We learned beading from Diane, who was uh, one of the staff members who took care of our hospitality. We played Bruno with her son Clinton, the groundskeeper. We met Irene, a local author and poet, who read us some of her works, including about her experience being forcibly removed from her family to attend a boarding school. I am extremely grateful that we were able to take this trip together. I'm grateful to Charlie Rupp and Mary Nesnick, our chaperones, and Kit Arrington, our trip leader. Shepherding other people's children can, on occasion, be tiring. <laughs> it can, on occasion, be difficult. It can, on occasion, be frustrating. And I'm extremely grateful for the grace and kindness of each of our adult leaders. I'm grateful to our participants, Ella and Jaya, William, Victor, and Ibi, for leaning into this incredible experience. You should all be proud of how well you carry yourselves in this new space. Proud of what you learned and proud of what you accomplished. I'm also grateful to you, the St. Mark's community, for all of the ways in which you supported our trip, financially, emotionally, spiritually. Together, you made it possible for this group of young people to have an experience of God in the world that they will never forget.
I know that the part of my favorite parts was actually right after that we came back from that hike. It was because one of the... Two things I'll always remember about Navajo land is the amazing sunset from the mountains and the amount of fun we had unloading the food boxes. During the beginning part of our trip, the youth and I decided to take a hike up a mountain behind St. Christopher's. I remember that the hike being really tiring because we had just eaten dinner and the mountain was pretty steep. However, once we got to the top of the mountain, it was beautiful, just breathtaking. The sunset was resting on top of another mountain that was across from us, and it looked like one of those postcards you would see in a store whenever you're visiting a place or a different country. Another one of my favorite parts was actually right after that we came back from that hike. It was because one of the food loads had just arrived, and we needed to unload it before heading back inside to go to bed. And we were all a little tired from that climb, but in the end, we had a great time. We would joke about why there were so many canned meetings, or why are there two different types of beef? Especially joking about why the flour that was the heaviest out of all of them. But even after, when we were doing our inventory, we had a laugh about when we counted all the canned soup through and there were actually two layers of soup in each box. We then had to recount all the canned soup boxes so I could get the correct inventory. While these parts may have just been my favorite, I enjoyed the whole trip and I can't wait for St. Mark's to go again. Hi, my name is Jaya Madhook, and I went to Navajo Land this summer for a church mission trip. In Navajo Land, my group cleaned out a cemetery, made jewelry with beads and juniper tree seeds, and swam in a lake with a pretty strong current and mountain climbed a couple of times. While I was there, I made a list of things that I wanted to bring back into my everyday life. Two of those things were to make jewelry more and be brave enough to do things I was afraid of. The reason I say make jewelry more is because during our jewelry making workshop, I felt confident in my work, and well, I wanted to wear it all the time. Um, the reason I say be brave is because, well, I'm kind of scared of water, and maybe watching Jaws didn't help with that. <laughs> While I was in Africa land, I went to a lake, knowing I'd be scared, but I ended up having a really good time. Also, I'm not really active, and the mountain climbing was pretty difficult. Anyways, the point is, I had a great time and I can't wait for the next mission trip. Hi everybody, my name is William and I was one of the youth who went on the trip. Throughout this trip to Navajo Land, I was really grateful to be able to help people. Whether it was moving food boxes by human conveyor belt or cooking for happy Navajos, I loved every minute that I could spend time with this amazing community. Their culture is extremely important to them, and it was a privilege to assist them by cleaning their graveyard and participating in their prayers, both in Navajo. In general, it was great to be able to be of service and help the Navajo, learning and interacting with them every day. Another component of the trip that I appreciated was exposing myself to new surroundings, in this case, to the very different environment that is Bluff, Utah. The land is gorgeous, and I had a blast hiking over the mountains and rocks across the desert. I especially love visiting Bears Ears National Monument, where we saw ruins from an ancient civilization. I loved the scenery overall and couldn't stop taking photos. Um, I really had such a great time, and I'd love to go again. Because while we were on the trip, 
uh, even though it was a service trip and I just wanted to be working the entire time, we really had more breaks to just talk to the people in the community and learn. Uh, we went to a museum where they had this settlement, like the ruins of one, and they had rebuilt this um, meeting place. It's basically just a hole in the ground called the Kima, and they would go in there to do ceremonies, or even just to have community meetings. And so I thought that was really cool. And uh, the most meaningful part of the trip to me was helping clear the cemetery, because in their culture, once somebody dies, it's not really them anymore. It's just the body, and they don't, they're not allowed to go in there and touch anything or clean up so they have to trust other people. It was really an honor that they put so much faith into us to take care of that space.
This was a really powerful um, one image from that exhibit. Um, next slide, please, Charlie. Uh, I want to talk about the relationship building that we had, starting with the morning prayer on our first morning, where St. Christopher's senior warden, Margaret Benali, ended the gathering on our first day by asking if we could all go around and share something about who we were and why we had come to visit. Um, and she then opened by telling some of her own story of leaving Bluff as a child to go and live with a foster family. Uh, she was actually in this area. She was, she was in Rockville, and uh, she's been to Shremont for camp. That's <laughs> 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 really interesting connection there. Um, and then returning home to raise her family in Bluff. We continued throughout the trip to encounter different opportunities of conversations where we learned about Diné people in the past and in current times, because the people we met were generous sharing their stories and their experiences. Uh, two people, Irene, a teacher and an author who we met in the community garden, returned the next day to share her writings, which included stories of how her mother and grandmother were violently forced by Mormon cowboys to leave a traditional sheep grazing location on the San Juan River, and how they could prove a claim to that land in later times, going back, by uncovering a, a cast iron skillet that her mother had hidden in the rocks when they were forced out. And it was still there, and that proved their story. Um, Esther was a visitor who came and shared a meal. She had stories both of her own experience being sent to boarding schools in the 1950s at age five. I want to point that out. The boarding schools went through the, the 60s. Um, most of the children were sent to boarding schools. How, how old were you in the 50s? Where were you with your family? And, and think about uh, being wrenched away from that in Central Boarding School, 100 miles away, for years. Um, at age five. At age five. So as well as the work, she shared that personal experience, as well as the work that she does now, finding opportunities for youth on the reservation to have activities to engage them and to learn and embrace their uh, culture. And this is a struggle against the generational loss of culture and community that results from that boarding school experience. Um, we did a lot of cooking our own meals together and generously shared what we made, and that created a, a wonderful space for some of these exchanges. I want to talk a little bit about the community challenges, and this is a great slide to, to show that. That truck and the um, trailer behind it is what carried the boxes that you then see below stacked in the room. Uh, the kind of community challenges that we learned about through these conversations were lack of employment opportunity, limited resources, lack of infrastructure support like electricity and water in a lot of the houses on the reservation, and denial of access to, or threats to, their own natural resources. Uh, for example, an interstate access agreement for the San Juan River ignores the historic Navajo rights to that water and need for that water, and it favors modern, heavily populated areas. Uh, Navajo living outside of the nearby Mormon town of Blanding, only now, after decades of requesting it, is the city building water lines to the Diné that live just outside of their town. Um, mining, there are over 500 abandoned Cold War era uranium mines on the Navajo Reservation that are being cleaned up. There, you, you see oil pumps near the homes um, and near to the sheep are not uncommon. These create environmental risks for the people and the profits are almost entirely exported and don't benefit the tribe. Uh, at St. Christopher's itself, there's a property owner in the cliffs above St. Christopher's that's proposing a, a fracking uh, contract, which the community fears could contaminate the spring that provides clean water that they make available to the community. We hear these stories as we hear explanations of why the food donations from the Mormons are needed, or why there is a need for the tiny houses to provide affordable weekday housing for employment and why there is a publicly accessible water pump just past the entrance where pickup trucks with large plastic tanks in their beds come to fill up each day. We learned of the ongoing impact of loss of culture and community from past and ongoing government and settler actions against the Dene people and communities from the 1864 long walk deportation, one of the um, uh, cast iron skillet story also had a story that her grandfather was not part of that walk because he fled the bear's ears and uh, lived there while a lot of other Navajo were displaced and died um, during the long walk. Um, so that, um, and then the 100 years of the Indian boarding schools, which didn't end until the 1960s. Um, so the next slide. On a more positive note, uh, culture and community. Uh, Father Liebler, the Episcopal priest who founded St. Christopher's Mission, came in the 1940s 
and he began to build a community that was founded on his recognition that the Diné values and culture already embraced and beautifully lived the values and spirit spirituality that he thought he would be bringing. Instead, he listened and he learned from the people and he sought to create a place and a community that honored those ways and helped to provide things that were needed. He brought schools, brought a school and the first health center where about 500 babies have been born, which is a real source of pride for the people who were those babies. Um, it makes that place a very special place related to their culture as well. They buried the umbilical cord nearby. Um, what, looks, what, what that looks like today is there's not a health care center. They now have a modern health care center in town and schools as well. Um, so today, um, they celebrated their 80-year anniversary with a convocation in June, just before we came, which included setting up a tent and holding a traditional Diné all-night ceremony with a medicine man. The community garden that they built, which you can see here, is a, the and most immediate um, is a, the St. Christopher's flowers that they grow for uh, to be able to use for uh, the decorations and the services. And Mary, who does uh, is on the altar guild for the National Cathedral, created this beautiful bouquet that they used for the service the Sunday that we left. Um, the community garden that they built was created in partnership with an agricultural branch of the University of Utah, and plants are available to anyone, hoping to provide a food source, an additional food source, and encourage healthy diets. Um, they are succeeding in helping to fulfill this mission of having all people who come to St. Christopher's feel welcome and cared for. Uh, the vision for the future includes creating a center for truth and reconciliation. They want to make more and more intentional the kind of experience that we had through um, more uh, informal opportunities, is what, what our experience was, and more through an intentional space. I've got a, a spiral line here that um, uh, outlines that vision a little bit. So, uh, moving to the end, where I want to wrap up by, uh, I want to thank Charlie very much for his tech support today. Charlie's tech expertise was one of the gifts that St. Mark's brought to St. Christopher's. Charlie spent an amount of time moving active and school surplus computer equipment into a space where they hoped to set up Zoom meetings and possibly services. Um, he created, tested, and trained the senior and junior warden on how the system worked. And he very generously provided his contact information for ongoing tech support. <laughs> when we departed, uh, we carried with us hope for future opportunities of connection with St. Christopher's. The people there proposed exploring some ideas that included, um, we had a book group um, a year ago where we read a, a Navajo Code Talk biography with people on Zoom at St. Christopher's and here. Um, they thought maybe we could do another one where we read one of the books that Father Lingo wrote. Um, they thought maybe we could do it um, how we have our Christmas fair, where uh, like people from Haiti come and, and we have people from different groups in the Middle East oil. Um, if they could, they could send um, some of the earrings and, and jewelry that they make. Um, and uh, Diane, the junior warden, who offered the jewelry making class, very generously should share. And if we do that, I want to set it up so that some of the funds can go to whatever the fund is at St. Mark's that helps kids to come out again. Um, uh, we, want, we could potentially host visitors to DC. Um, one of the things they spoke about, they learned uh, that uh, Caleb has uh, experience teaching public speaking, and they said that their youth could really benefit from um, some public speaking lessons, and they love the idea of us coming back, maybe with a program that we engage their youth with some public speaking lessons. Um, I think we've got great examples here of, of uh, 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 how that can look. Um, and a, a St. Mark's adult trip. For St. Mark's, the relationship that we've established is one that we can explore deepening for our youth, and for the entire congregation, adult trips would be just as possible and rich as youth trips, which was the experience that Caleb, Steve, and Steve Dozell and I had when we went last November, and which Mary had when uh, she went over the holidays. Um, we, had a, we had a wonderful trip. There are many, many stories left, left to tell that have been untold, and we look forward to sharing them with you. Um, we're grateful for the generous support that we received from the St. Mark's community to make it possible. Um, it made it, uh, we thought this was going to be an extremely expensive trip for the families. It ended up uh, being uh, quite, quite manageable and affordable because of everyone's generosity and also that makes the future trips seem more likely that we know that we can do, do this at a, at a manageable budget. We were also able to be giving, we think it's going to be $1,000 to St. Christopher's from the money that was raised. Um, 
that drive, it's that drive me, right? <laughs> I have a question. Uh, maybe I thought it was fantastic what you said about what you learned about the history of, uh, <clears throat> actually, I guess it was the, was it the deacon or the priest of the church who had been taken to boarding school. And what's happening for schooling for the kids now? And I imagine they're in school in the local uh, towns. <laughs> but is there sensitivity in the schools there for talking about the history of the uh, Well, we only got a chance to meet like two other people that our age that live in the town. But I think they have a school in their town, and I imagine they're very sensitive to the subject. And unlike a lot of schools here, they probably dive in depth to the history. So. I can share a story that I, I learned when we were there in November, where someone said um, that uh, a lot of the kids aren't um, learning as much Navajo from their, uh, at home, that the grandparents might speak it, but the parents might not. Um, but that they're teaching it in the schools again, and that's where they're learning it. So, so they're absolutely embracing it in those local schools. <laughs> Or were you unplugged for a week? Uh, they 
had Wi-Fi at the place that we were staying where our rooms were, but I know a lot, like if you walk away from it, you just have no connection. And the service was down for a little bit. It was kind of um, relaxing. <laughs>
Um, so we budgeted for about thirteen fifty per participant, uh, one thousand three hundred fifty dollars per uh, participant. Uh, we raised. Um, the generosity of this community has continued even since we have, since we were there and since we have been back. Last count I knew was a little bit short of five thousand. 